to all the beings with whom we share the planet, and all the beings who will come after us. And, and yet we don't get quite as outraged when people suggest, wouldn't you just like to just kind of walk away from that responsibility to all these other creatures in the world? You know, especially when they're as, as threatened with such an emergent crisis as we face right now. And with the climate crisis rearing its head more and more every day, and we're, we're seeing the real impacts of it with, with superstorms that are, that are wiping out cities, uh, particularly in, in developing countries and in low lying nations like the Philippines that just get hit with one massive cyclone after another. We're seeing it already in, in ecosystem collapses with, with the sixth extinction that we're in the midst of right now losing countless species, and we're on track to lose 50% uh, of all species on the planet. To, to walk away from that responsibility is, is certainly just as immoral as, as walking away from the responsibility to our own family members. And, and so that has got to be what keeps driving us day after day. And usually that's enough. That, that works in most days to, to get me continuing doing this work and showing up. But I'll admit, I'll make a confession here. Last Saturday, before I left on this trip, I spent a good six hours on the internet looking at wooden boat plans <laughs> and, and wooden boat building schools and traditional wooden boat building apprenticeships. There's this great place called the Apprentice Shop in Rockland, Maine, that's got a two-year program to, to learn all the intricacies of building and repairing old wooden boats. And, and I spent six hours just geeking out on this and, and imagining a very different life for myself in, in which I could leave a lot of this behind and, move up to Maine and, and build wooden boats and, and live a fairly reclusive life. And I gotta tell you, after, after my six hours of, of going deep into that, I'm pretty sure I would be a really good boat builder. <laughs> and, and I think I could, I could justify it pretty well. You know, especially building the, the rowboats, for me, is just uh, such a powerful thing. Uh, if you've ever rowed a boat, you know that feeling when you first get in and you first pull on those oars and you get like that connection with the body of water that you're in. It's like in the Matrix when they plug people in to the Matrix and they take that big metal thing and they shove it into the back of their head and they're and all of a sudden they're connected to this whole other world, right? Um, but, but rowing a boat is kind of like that in reverse because when they plug people into the Matrix, they're plugging them into this digital artificial world. And, and when you pull on those oars and it plugs you into that body of water, it plugs you into the earth, it, it brings you out of that artificial world, um, and that fake sense of detachment that we have for so much of our lives, where we see ourselves as this isolated individual, and it plugs us in to this deeper connectedness uh, with the world. And surely the, the vehicle that can, can bring that kind of connection to us, that kind of robo, it's got to be some kind of transcendental, magical, spiritual vehicle. And, and to spend a life building wooden rowboats, uh, it's, it's got to be a, a worthwhile cause, right? And, and yet I know that, that if I went down that path, I couldn't actually be happy doing it. Because I would know that there is a fight that needs to be fought, that there is a struggle going on against the fossil fuel industry and a struggle for a livable world, and, and that I have a role in that struggle, that, that I have a place in this movement that is fighting for climate justice, and, and that I can do good work in that struggle, that, that I can work with people who are doing civil disobedience and, and help support them and make their actions more powerful and I can engage in that kind of action myself and, and help wake up new communities of people who aren't paying attention to this crisis 
and I can show up at legislative hearings and speak out, and I can speak to crowds of people and, and help invite them into this movement. I can do all these things, and, and if I walked away from that and was living up in Maine somewhere building wooden boats, I would always have that calling lingering in my mind, drawing me back. And, and it would be driving me crazy, as long as I knew that I could be effective in this movement, doing, doing good work. And, and so I know that I can't really go and be a wooden boat builder, it, at least as long as I have a place here. You know, maybe one day when, when somebody does a, a character assassination against me and you all find out all the worst things that I've ever done, and, and you all hate me, and, and you can't stand me and you wouldn't want to work with me ever again, maybe then I could go off and, and be a boat builder up in, up in Maine. Or you know, maybe that's why I usually don't prepare any of my speeches until right beforehand, because if I get to that point one day where the Spirit just doesn't move me with any message to deliver, and I don't have anything to say, then I know it's time to go be a boat builder. But as long as, as long as I have something to say, as, as long as that, that web of life that I'm connected to and that spirit of life is, is calling me into this work and giving me a message to deliver, then I have to keep showing up and delivering it because I know that I can be effective here. And yet, that, that doesn't quite work for me all the time either. That, that gets, gets me through a few more days um, than, than some of the other reasons. But there are also times when I really question my effectiveness in doing this work. And, and I question a lot of our effectiveness and, and all the people who are putting such passionate efforts into this work and, and organizing together. I question, what, I question how much of a difference that we make sometimes. And, and particularly in times like these where we can look back at the last year climate movement when we have won so many victories and we have we have made so much progress and opened up so many new possibilities that, that weren't in existence a year ago. And we've had unprecedented victories like stopping the Keystone XL pipeline, stopping the Port Ambrose LNG facility in New York, now stopping the Jordan Cove facility here in Oregon. And and we've We've seen that we're actually building enough power to start holding companies like Exxon accountable. And, and we've got about a dozen attorney generals from states across the, the country that are now investigating Exxon Mobil for, for their fraud and lying about climate change, which was unthinkable a year ago. We're, we're seeing things that, um, that we didn't think was possible. Like, I was up here in the Northwest in January with the Climate Disobedience Center, and we were working with the Delta Five activists who had blockaded an oil train, and they were taking their case to trial. And, and they were able to present the necessity defense, which was the argument that I wasn't able to present my case. And, and in most civil disobedience cases, people aren't able to, to explain their whole reasoning in this way. And, and these activists were able to to put on expert witnesses for five days and present the most comprehensive case for climate activism that I've ever seen um, anywhere, especially in a courtroom where I didn't think it was possible to talk in such an idealistic way as, as they did. And, and it was revolutionary to, to see that happen in an American courtroom. We're seeing all these victories, and yet, even as we see so much progress and so many positive opportunities opening up, we can also look at the, the physical facts of climate change that we've seen and the science that we've seen over the past year, where, where things are getting much worse, much faster than, than we anticipated. And we're getting more and more bad news. We're finding out things like last fall when we found out that China had actually been underreporting their coal use for the last few years by 17%, which is a lot. It means that basically, in terms of emissions, we have another Germany on the planet that we didn't, weren't calculating for in terms of how much we need to reduce our emissions. 
And then we had the, the Porter Ranch gas leak in California that became this huge unprecedented source of methane emissions that was not in any of our calculations about how to deal with this problem. And we started hearing new studies coming out about ice sheet melt in Greenland and in Antarctica and, and the, the now inevitable collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And we saw October that was the record warmest month in history. And then November broke that record by the largest margin between any two months ever in, in recorded temperatures. And then January broke the record of, of November. And then February broke January's record by an even larger margin. And so we're seeing, we're seeing the actual impacts of climate change spinning out of control here. And so we have to question if, if we are really as effective as, as we think we are. And if, and if our basis for doing this work is only the outcomes and only that we think we're going to stop these harms or that we think we're going to save certain things, that leaves us pretty vulnerable to being demoralized and discouraged when, when we look at all the things that we can't stop. And when we look at the, the basic reality of climate change that we're not going to stop it at one point past that point. We're not going to stop at a 2 degrees C. That, that would take basically shutting off our, our whole industrial economy pretty quickly. Um, that, that we're not really on track for that. And, and this is part of why I made the decision a few years ago to go to divinity school and, and to start tapping into the religious traditions of activism. Because I think one of the things that distinguishes faith-based activism from, from other kinds of activism is that it's not just based on the outcomes, that, that we are not taking these bold actions and putting all this effort in, into our climate activism just because we expect a certain outcome. That we are, we are purpose-driven in our activism. To me, that is what it means to be a faith-based activist. That, that we are approaching this work and taking these bold actions, not just because we think it's going to do something down the road, but because that's how we are called to live, because that's our purpose, that's our principles that, that drive us into doing this work. And, and I think that, that has led me to start asking, what in our spiritual traditions do we have to draw upon? To, to do this work of climate justice activism and, and to keep striving forward in the way that we need to strive forward. And, and I've gotten more and more involved with sort of the, the faith and climate world uh, and, and it's a burgeoning sphere of folks that are trying to approach climate change with a faith-based perspective. And I've gone to lots of conferences and gatherings and that sort of thing of religious leaders trying to, to address climate justice. And, and generally, I leave pretty disappointed from all of those gatherings, because when they ask that question of, of what kind of spiritual resources we have to draw upon to do this work, they, they say, well, we've, we've got these scriptures that say we should care for the earth, and, and these scriptures that say, um, you know, there's some that say that, that water is important, and there's some that say the trees are important. Um, and you know, so all these, all these scriptures say that we should care for the earth. Um, and, and I leave so frustrated, uh, not only because I'm a Unitarian and I don't have the scriptures to be able to, to throw out there with everybody else, but, but also because that's not our challenge anymore. Caring for the earth is not our challenge anymore. That was the challenge of previous generations. And they fell short on that challenge. And our challenge now is figuring out how we keep working for justice against impossible odds. How we can hold on to our humanity in, in these chaotic and disruptive times. And, and how we can move forward with a sense of faith and a sense of hope that's not based on optimism. And that, I think, is, is our real challenge. And also where we do have strong spiritual resources 
to be able to draw upon that, that I think a lot of the, the movements in the past that had such an anchor in religious communities, part of the reason they had it was that their, their jobs seemed so impossible. And last night I was having a conversation uh, with Marilyn and others about the abolition movement and, and how a big job of the abolition movement and the abolitionists was to just reimagine what could be possible to imagine a different world when, when it seemed so unthinkable. And, and I think we are in that situation again, except that, that our, our challenge now is not to reimagine a, a utopia, but to reimagine a more difficult world, uh, a world with more genuine material hardship, and reimagine ourselves going through struggle without turning against one another, but to imagine that we can face hardship and it can bring out the best in us instead of bringing out the worst in us. It can turn us towards our communities in a cooperative way instead of against one another in a fearful and competitive kind of way. And, and that's a big task uh, of imagining. And, and it's easy to see once we get into that task of imagining that even as we fail in some of our goals to reduce emissions and to keep it at 1.5 C and all those direct things and to keep it at 350 parts per million, even if we fail in some of those goals, that, that, we, can, that we can draw out the best parts of our human nature through this struggle, that there can be positive things that come out of this hardship and come out of this crisis as, as we find our deepest, most beautiful natures in, in helping one another through this time of crisis. And yet, and yet, that still doesn't quite get me all the way to keeping my motivation every single day in doing this work. That still sometimes falls short. Because ultimately, what I remember is that for all the, for all the good work that we can do for one another, and all the lives that we can save through activism, we're not really saving those lives. That we're all still going to die. And, and that all this good work that we do, not only in climate activism, but in all kinds of activism, and in all kinds of small acts of kindness, all the people that we do those efforts for, they're still going to die. And so we are left with this, with this question of how does, how does that make sense? And one of the, the, the best spiritual resources or scriptures that I encountered in my first two years of divinity school was The Road by Cormac McCarthy. And, and the, the Road is a novel about this, this post-apocalyptic, extremely bleak world, actually more bleak than pretty much any climate change scenario, and in which a father and son are, are just continually walking down this road without really knowing what they're walking towards. And, and one of the central questions in that book is whether or not it's ethical to keep striving, to keep working in such a bleak and hopeless world, and particularly to keep raising a child in, in such a bleak world with, with such a dark outcome in front of them. And it's, a, and it's a debate that's happening between the father and the now dead mother who has taken her own life she decided that it wasn't ethical to keep going down that road in such a bleak world. And in the very end of that book, the very last paragraph, is this lyrical passage about brook trout and, and the worm-eaten patterns on the back of the brook trout that map out something that has always been coming and that can never be made right again, can never be put back. And what it's saying in that passage is that death is written on our bodies from the moment that we were born. And it's always been that way, and, and that, that can never be made right again. And, and I think part of the message behind that book is that in a world like the road, our mortality, our death that's, that's looming in front of us, is really clear. It's really clear to see that the outcome is not going to be something positive. But yet, that has always been the case. And, and it's, it's easier to deny that in, in, in our comfortable lives like we live now. 
it's easier to deny that the end that we face is, is a death. And yet, the reality is the same. Whether it's a world like the road, or whether it's the, the climate constricted future that we face, or whether it's the, the world of abundance that we have now, we still face that same end. And so, if our reason for striving, if our reason for struggling for justice and standing up to our, for our values and holding on to our principles, if, if our reasons for that don't make sense in a climate constricted future, in which we're not going to stop at a two degree C. If it doesn't make sense in a world like the road, then then those that system of meaning has really never made sense. Because we're always facing this end. And that we have to find a system of meaning based on the here and now. And where I found that in my first couple of years of divinity school is, is from someone that I consider to be the greatest theologian of the 21st century. And that's Andrea Gibson. And one of the things that, that Andrea Gibson says is, I don't know how I will ever make sense of the shortness of your lifespan, but I promise that you will know you are loved for every second you are here. And that to me, that to me is, is a much more firm footing for for why we do this work, and why we keep making sacrifices and struggling for climate justice. So, so that those around us, and that those who come after us, will know that they were loved. And certainly we can say that with words. I'm not particularly the best at, at expressing this, as most of my ex-girlfriends can tell you. <laughs> and, and I know that I know that there's no way with my words that I could ever say it convincingly enough. How much I love the people around me and how much I love those that I haven't even met yet that will come after me. I know that, that if I stick around for a while and I meet some young person in 2050, towards the end of my life, some young person who's born into this broken world, there's no way with words alone that I could ever convince them that I loved them back in this moment. And, and, I, and I certainly couldn't do it better than, than a Hallmark card or, or a Hollywood movie or, or any of the other hollow ways in which we, we express nice things with words in our culture. It, with such a culture of deception and dishonesty um, where words don't really seem to mean that much and you know, we can see it in our politics today where, you know, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton can go out and say whatever they want, regardless of the facts. Um, it, it, just those words enough are never going to convince folks that I love them enough, as, as strongly as I do. And I, and I know that the only way to, to convince people that, that they are loved for every second that they are here, regardless of their sh the shortness of their lifespan, is to fight for them to stand up and fight against the threats to their lives and the threats to their future. That it's only through those actions, it's only through showing up again and again and again, even when it doesn't seem like it's working, even when we're not making progress as fast as the crisis is accelerating, we keep showing up to, to remind the people around us that they are loved for every second that they are here. And we might not be able to control what that end result is. We not, might not be able to shape what the world in 2100 looks like, but we can make sure that whoever is left in 2100 will know that they were loved back in 2016 by those who stood up and engaged in this struggle against impossible odds and kept doing it every day and didn't go and become boat builders. But, but kept showing up to make those sacrifices. Another of my, my favorite things that Andrea Gibson said is, I am going to run into the rain over and over with an empty glass until you are soaking in the certainty that nothing falls in vain. And when I think
think about the fall that we are headed for as a society and as individuals who will only live for so long. I want, I want my activism and our activism together to remind all of us that nothing falls in vain. Thank you. 
working within the system and, and filing lawsuits and uh, all that sort of stuff, which I think also needs to happen and needs to reinforce the, the direct action side of things. Um, and then, of course, all the folks on the other side building up that clean energy economy. Um, so that's all the stuff that people are doing. Um, or that's not all the stuff, there's more stuff. But that, you know, that's the, the sphere of the things that people are already trying, which we need more people to keep doing. You know, we need more efforts in those regards. But also all those things that people are doing um, are not enough. And, um, and all of us that are trying everything that we can think of, um, we haven't found the right answer yet. So nobody really knows how to solve the climate crisis because nobody's ever done it before. And, and there are folks with some ideas and we're trying those ideas, but we need new ideas. And, and so, you know, the other answer to that question of, of what people should be doing, what an individual can do, um, is that you need to come up with something new. And you need to not just wait until, like, the guy on the stage with the microphone tells you what to do. Uh, or the, the, you know, the person running the, the NGO tells you what to do. Um, you need to take your own initiative. Um, and you need to try things and you need to speak from your own voice, which, which I think is, is really critical at, at getting through to people who aren't already motivated on this issue. Um, you know, the, the sort of experts in the movement can tell you what they think is going to be effective messaging, um, but odds are they're already using that effective me that, that messaging, and maybe it is effective for some folks. Um, but they're already they're already giving that message, and and there are more people that need to be woken up and brought into this movement. And so we need more stories, more perspectives that that are articulated in in the public space, and and so you need to be telling your own personal truth out there with your activism um, to try to reach the people that aren't being reached already by the existing messages. So uh, I, I encourage people to be creative uh, and take their own action, but to do so knowing that there's a movement ready to support you, uh, that, that there are people ready to, to help broadcast your story uh, and to have your back when you stick your neck out. That, that there really is that movement there. So um, it's, it's sort of a, an effort of thinking as an individual and as a movement at the same time, of telling your particular personal truth and, and doing it knowing that you've got a movement behind you. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question now, and I want to invite you to pass on anything you might not want to answer. Okay. This one, what did prison teach you that you couldn't learn elsewhere? Well, that's another big question. Um, I've been giving some guest sermons on this topic, actually. Um, prison taught me to believe in evil. And, and I don't know that I really did beforehand. Um, or at least I didn't understand it beforehand. Um, but it, it taught me to believe that, um, that this interconnected web of life that we are a part of um, also contains evil, and, and that, it, that it touches all of us because we're a part of that interconnected web of life, that, um, that there is systemic evil that, um, that subtly infects us and, um, and to which none of us, I think, are immune. Um, and, and that's something that, um, that I have struggled to make sense of and, and to articulate, and um, and I think it's something that often doesn't get talked about in our, in our Unitarian communities in particular. All right. What do you advocate for teachers at school or above to do with regard to educating young people today, especially knowing that optimism isn't necessarily honest? Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of giving young people the benefit of the doubt that they can handle more than we think they can handle. Um, I was at a protest just a couple of weeks ago in Washington, D.C., in, in front of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, and, and it was a really wonderful protest in which I was cooking pancakes. Um, some folks blockading the entrance of FERC. And if you wonder how those two things
things to go together. You can um, Google Josh Fox, The Last Drop. He made a little film about this protest. Um, but one of the things that, that was not in that film is that one of the people risking arrest um, was Bethany Yarbo. And, and she had her daughter, Valentina, who was about 10 years old, there. And when the seven or so people that were blockading the driveway, they went down into this driveway, and then the police made a barrier right in front of them. And so all the rest of us were all held back by this police blockade. And, and Bethany and the other six were probably like 40 yards down in front of us. And they were all singing. Um, Bethany's a really powerful singer, so she was leading everybody else in singing. Um, and her daughter, Valentina, then was like behind these cops, but could see her mother, um, and got really frightened of this whole situation. Um, and, and she kind of got overwhelmed and started crying, and, and she had to like kind of step back away from that front line and sit down with, with her stepfather and some of her mother's friends who, who comforted her for a few minutes. But then after a few minutes, she came back to that front line and stood there face to face with, with these police officers. Um, and, and kept singing with her mother. And, you know, would occasionally be, be visually shaken with another wave of fear and, and cry a little more, but keep holding her ground and, and keep singing until her mother was, was arrested and walked right past her in, in handcuffs. Um, and, and that was a, a challenging thing to watch. Um, to, to see a child placed in, in that kind of situation. But if we're all honest about the, the future that that 10 year old is gonna experience over her lifetime, she's gonna need at least that degree of, of resilience and, and toughness that, that she was developing there, standing in front of, of those line of cops. Um, you know, and she was able to see that ultimately her mother was okay and got released later that afternoon. Um, but, but saw that, that example from, from her mother of, of doing something really bold like that. Um, and, I, and I think young people can, can handle that while they might be shaken up. Um, I, think, I think it's important to, to tell them the full truth and encourage them to um, engage with this crisis in in more ways, um, in, including taking action on their own, um, and including saying things that that we might not agree with. You know, like we, we have to encourage young people to come to their own conclusions. And if we want to empower young people and to to really engage in in any kind of activism, um, we we have to trust them to come to their own conclusions, even when it's different than ours. Um, we're certainly seeing that in public right now, you know, with um, folks who for, for years said, you know, why aren't young people more politically engaged? And now young people have gotten politically engaged, and the Hillary campaign really doesn't like it. <laughs> and, and it's been incredibly belittling and condescending and hostile to young activists. And, and I think we have to stand up against that. We have to push back um, and and defend those young people's right to to engage. Even in the Population growth is is 
more opportunities for development, um, better education, and particularly empowerment of young women and education for women. one's own personal carbon footprint 
is the most effective way of fighting climate change. Um, you know, there, there was a, a chapter in the climate movement in, in our past um, in which like every list of things you can do to, to fight climate change was all consumer based. It was all changing your consumer habits and you know, reducing your, how much meat you eat you know, was always towards the top of that list of the consumer things that you can do to reduce your personal carbon footprint. Um, and, and I think gradually more and more folks realized that, that just telling people to change their consumer habits was, was one, not addressing the, the root of the problem, and two, potentially even reinforcing the root of the problem of telling people that, that the most important part of who they are is who they are as a consumer. And that if they if they want to have an impact, that that they should tap into their consumer power, um, and that, that that focus on consumer identity is actually part of the root of our problems of of our overconsumption, of trying to, to create our personal meaning based on who we are as a consumer, um, and and more and more the movement is looking towards challenging things systemically. I think the better question is. Why is there not more of a movement that is challenging the animal agricultural industry and that is challenging that structurally? And um, and there are some there are some that that are um, doing that groups like the Union of Concerned Scientists and the Center for Biological Diversity, Food and Water Watch. Um, but but certainly there's not the kind of movement fighting the animal agricultural industry that there is fighting the fossil fuel industry. Um, um, you know, there was a film that, that asked that question, why not? Um, Cowspiracy, which I'm sure some folks have seen. And, you know, it was done with all the integrity of Andrew Breitbart or Glenn Beck um, that, that tries to kind of trap people. Um, and I did. I watched it. please don't. We're I watched it. In the cards. And, and I saw that, you know, it was somebody who kind of had his like Facebook factoid and went to all the groups that are fighting the fossil fuel industry to try to like uh, trap them. And their general response was, you know, things are more complicated than that. These are interconnected. Um, and, uh, and he sort of edited them to make it look like they were hiding something. And he asked the question of, you know, are they actually taking money from the animal agricultural industry? And the evidence was that no, they weren't. But he left it hanging like those questions on Glenn Beck's chalkboard. You know, when he maps stuff out, he's like, is maybe George Soros behind all of this? And he doesn't actually provide any evidence for that, but he leaves the question lingering there. Um, and, it's, and it was that kind of like um, manipulation tactics that um, I think made that for a week of film. Um, and it didn't do justice to that question. And, and it's a shame because I wish, I wish vegan activists had genuinely asked that question of why more of the environmental movement doesn't want to work with them. And, and personally, there are a lot of folks in the environmental movement that don't want to work with me. And, and every time I've honestly asked myself the question of why these folks don't want to work with me, and, and when I've asked it, not like, what's wrong with these people? Um, but, but genuinely and reflectively asked that question. The answer has almost always been, because I've been a dick to them. <laughs> and, you know, this work is hard enough when you're doing it with nice people. That, that you can trust and are supportive. Um, and, and there are lots of battles that need to be fought. Um, you know, contrary to the misinformation in that film, we need to fight both the animal agricultural industry and the fossil fuel industry. We can't just stop eating meat and keep burning fossil fuels. We need to do both. And so if there's multiple battles to fight, if there's multiple battles to fight, you're going to fight them with the people that you want to actually be around. And, you know, so 
So I would offer folks asking that question in the same advice that I try to remind myself of um, on a regular basis. Um, the, the advice that I learned from some of the old monkey wrenchers in Utah, like Jim Stiles, that if you want to build a movement for serious change, it takes more than just being right. It takes more than just facts. It also takes not being an asshole. So I think approaching that question with a little more humility um, and a little more desire to really meet people with genuine relationships um, could go a long way towards building the kind of movement that we need against the animal agricultural industry.
of being judged by those around them than they are by, by physical dangers, even, even the risk of death. Um, that, that idea of being judged is a, is a very vulnerable thing, um, and I think really taps into the power of civil disobedience. And so I think to answer that question about the most powerful things that, that we can do, um, it's, it's civil disobedience that doesn't just end at the point of, of arrest or um, doesn't just happen in front of a coal train or that sort of thing, but, but takes a broader view of disobedience and dissent, of like stepping out of the norm in society um, and putting oneself in a vulnerable position. Um, I think that's where we're at our boldest when, when we don't just sort of arrange this certain action that has these limitations, but, but look at civil disobedience more as a way of living in which there are, there are no boundaries to the ends of our actions, but that, but that we are in that action for life, um, and in that civil disobedience for life. Um, that's, I think, where we're oldest, and, and it sends a powerful message that people are willing to, to give their lives into this movement. Which I think a lot of people are doing. Uh, I think a lot of people are giving their lives to this movement and are dedicating their whole lives to this movement. Um, but we're not doing a good enough job of telling that story, of, of, of showing those outside of this room or outside of our organizations the way in which people are giving their lives. And, and that is such a, a powerful message and reaches people on such a deep level and cuts through all the intellectual barriers and that sort of thing that people have to hearing about this issue. I think when, when, we, can, when we can show the way in which we're doing our lives, we, we become incredibly powerful. So I encourage all of us to try to show that a little better. Thanks for coming out tonight.